Hello friends! If you're interested in the basics of Buddhism and want a fun introduction to the history, beliefs, and practices of the various Buddhist lineages, I have a great new learning platform to share with you, Buddhist Studies Online or BSO. Today I'm talking with Dr. Kate Hartman, a Harvard PhD in Religious Studies and one of the folks behind Buddhist Studies Online and the instructor for BSO 101 about the history, philosophy, and practice of Buddhism. Kate is an assistant professor of religious studies in the Department of Philosophy and Religious Studies at the University of Wyoming. She received a PhD in religious studies focused on Tibetan Buddhism from Harvard University in May 2020. Her research focuses on the history of pilgrimage to holy mountains in Tibet. She also helped develop and launch Buddhist Studies Online, an educational platform aimed at making academic courses on Buddhism more accessible to the public. If you'd like to hear more about her story of connecting with Buddhism as an undergrad, then traveling around Asia in the course of her studies, you can find a link in the show notes to an interview she did with Seth Powell, who helped found BSO. I hope you enjoy the conversation, and if you'd like to learn more about BSO 101 or 102, Buddhist Meditation in Theory and Practice, you can find links to both those courses in the show notes. So welcome everyone. I am super excited to have Dr. Kate Hartman on today. Um, I have to say when I ran across Buddhist studies online and I saw your courses and once I started actually going through Buddhism, Buddhist studies online 101, which is an intro to Buddhism, I was like in love, like academic love. <laughs> I actually found BSO because I was like, Somebody needs to make a high quality intro to Buddhism course. Maybe I should do that. And I started looking around. And I was like, oh, perfect. Someone has done it. You're a Harvard trained professor. Like, my God, this is great. I'm just going to point everyone to Buddhism online. So I'm just curious. Um, I want to hear about your story, your dissertation on pilgrimage, your academic journey through the University of Virginia, University of Chicago, Harvard. But I want to start with probably the thing that's going to be like the most um, helpful to the audience, which is, could you give me an overview of your course, BSO 101, and what it offers to students? Yeah, so I'm similarly to you, um, having been interested in Buddhism, sometimes get frustrated with the way that Buddhism gets talked about in the public sphere. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that there's lots of stuff out there and... You know, sometimes, you know, I got a PhD in Buddhism and sometimes relatives at Thanksgiving would be like, so what's Buddhism all about? <laughs> in five minutes right or now. less. <laughs> I know. But, you know, I wanted to point, be able to point people to a resource that I mm -hmm. sort of trusted that I thought was academically rigorous, that yeah. wasn't going to be, you know, too tilted in terms of, you know, someone on the outside versus, you know, practitioner, just, mm -hmm. just something that was going to be a basic introduction to orient people. Mm -hmm. um, just to help them have a sense of what this was. And um, I thought that the online space was a really good opportunity to do it. Yeah. This was during COVID. And so kind of a lot of the things that we had taken for granted, mm -hmm. for one, that these is, this is the kind of course that you would take on a college campus and that you take when you're 18 to 22 and then <laughs> right. you go off and work and you don't think about these things again. <laughs> um, when actually we sort of, you know, and there's lots of pros and cons to the way that we all shifted online during COVID. It was not easy by any stretch of the imagination, but it did open up certain new possibilities for thinking about how we could take a course like this that previously might only be available on a college campus and make it available to a broader audience. And so the course really is structured according to how I teach my students intro to Buddhism. And I'm a professor at the University of Wyoming, and so Basically, the course is what I teach my students, um, just shifted into this kind of six-module format. So there's you know, 90 minutes of lecture. There was a 90-minute live Q&A session that was pre-recorded and is available to students if they want it. There's a quiz. There's a handout. And just you know, in six 90-minute chunks, just giving you an orientation towards the broader world of Buddhism. And once you have that, you can say, oh, I'm really interested in this, or I want to follow up more on that. And, you know, it's really just the first um, map for what will hopefully be a long journey for people into exploring these things. Yeah, it's it's such a great resource. And I just want to add to what you've to what you've shared that the reading it's 
It's basically like what I had in mind. You know, what if you had all the fun parts of a college course, but you didn't have to write any papers, you weren't going to get a grade, <laughs> and also all the readings are available as PDFs, so you don't have to go and buy like six textbooks that cost $100 each. Um, I love that aspect of it too. Yeah, it was really important to me that this be kind of all in one, mm -hmm. right? Because, you know, you could put out a podcast and say, oh, go buy this book, but you know, that introduces logistical challenges and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And so um, made the PDFs available. They're largely from, you know, if folks want to go out and buy this book, the Norton Anthology of World Religions has great um, series on all sorts of world religions. In the Buddhism one, edited by Don Lopez of the University of Michigan, there are great translations of primary sources from the Buddhist tradition themselves with good short introductions. And then I think I assign a couple things from other sorts of places, but you know, that Norton Anthology of World Religions Buddhism is such a useful resource for this. Yeah, definitely. I think sometimes people want to learn about Buddhism by just sitting down with the primary texts and they can be very difficult. So it's so great to have the, the combination of you have the text in your hand, but then also someone's going to walk you through it and make it alive in a way that I think is difficult when you're reading something, you know, that was maybe composed 2,500 years ago. Yes. And a lot of how I think about reading these texts with people interested in them comes from having worked with college students on these texts, where if you throw um, the Dhammachaka Pavatana, the Sutra, <laughs> Sutta of Turning the Wheel, the Buddha's first sermon, in front of a college student, they'll say, why is this so repetitive? Right. What's going on? I have no idea what's going on in this middle part. Why are they saying this? They're not necessarily easy texts to yeah. read yeah. because they're not written for a reader who is trained in the ways that we usually read in this modern world. Yes. This is a text that was meant for memorization. Mm -hmm. It would have been, you know, not necessarily something you'd just like pick up off the side of the road and read and put down having fully understood it. <laughs> no, you have to engage these texts in um, a way appropriate to mm -hmm. um, understanding their meaning. And so that's actually something that we talk about in the course as well. Not just what is a Buddhist text, but like, how do you read it? Mm -hmm. How do you mm -hmm. make sense of it? Mm -hmm. um, what are the things you could be looking for? And so I, I want to, again, with the idea that this is just a basic kind of map orienting people towards further journeys, mm -hmm. you could read a sutta um, and, you know, that's perfectly fine, but I want to give you the skills to read whatever it is that you want to read in the future. Mm -hmm. I, I, I love that approach. You know, it, you walk people through the history of Buddhism, the beliefs, and it really does feel like you're offering us sort of the map so we can go where we want to. I, I think often, you know, if you approach Buddhism from like a Tibetan Dharma center, for instance, you're going to get a very Tibet centered view of what Buddhism is. And instead with, you know, BSO 101, you really walk people through you know, the, the time of the Buddha, the teachings at that point, and, and the development really into the modern era, which I think is, I just appreciate as somebody with a background in this, I can see where there's not the bias that there often is in, you know, a course or a program that's coming from maybe a Dharma center, where they have a pedagogical interest in the student knowing what's going to be helpful in the student's practice life. And you just are offering like, okay, here's the terrain, you choose. <laughs> Yeah, and it's, you know, part of the reason I got into religious studies at all is that religion is something, you know, and, and some of your audience may be saying, Buddhism is not a religion. We deal with that in the course as well. <laughs> but um, it's a thing about which there can be multiple forms of expertise, right? So who is an mm -hmm. expert on Buddhism? Mm -hmm. You have someone who got a PhD at an academic institution. That's one form of expertise that reflects my training. But as I've experienced over and over again traveling to Asia, the type of training I have really does not equip me to know <laughs> much of anything in certain contexts. So you can imagine, you know, a highly trained meditator whose knowledge comes from hours and hours of practice. You could imagine someone who's a scholar within the tradition. Yeah. You could imagine someone who's not necessarily a scholar in the tradition, but just grew up with it in a way mm -hmm. that I didn't because, you know, I've traveled a lot. I've done a lot of study, but I've you know, been informed by books. Mm -hmm. You know, there's all these different ways of expertise. And taking a step back and thinking about that, I think is really helpful. Because mm -hmm. I've done a lot of stuff in Dharma contexts as well. And often teachers, you know, will be oriented towards, okay, I'm here to increase wisdom and reduce suffering. Right, and right. 
if I feel like taking kind of a, a shortcut or like eliminating a confusing point or mm-hmm. giving a narrative that's going to make the most sense and be the most helpful to a practitioner, you know, you might do that. And there's perfectly good reasons to do that. Buddhists throughout history have done that. Whereas the perspective of the academic historian is, um, you know, going to be coming from a different point of view. Mm-hmm. And, you know, no one approach, no one form of knowledge is inherently better or worse than the other. But just, you know, getting to appreciate the different ways of knowing about mm-hmm. Buddhism, I think, enhances your engagement with the tradition. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, I, I know a lot of long term dedicated meditators and practitioners who don't necessarily feel confident that they know what Buddhism is. I mean, it's huge. It's vast. And I think sometimes people feel like there's this big barrier to entry, you know, like like you would have to go and sign up for a couple of courses at a local college or university or something just to understand, you know, all the historical context. And that's something that I really appreciate about your approach. It, you know, it condenses and you get the things you need to know to be able to understand without necessarily, I mean, you know, you could, many people have gone through an entire like master's degree and PhD on the finer points of just like one specific Buddhist tradition. Um, So I think it's wonderful to have that, you know, even if your approach is that you're a practitioner and a meditator, it's great to also have that complementary approach, especially I think for those of us who didn't grow up in a Buddhist culture and, you know, maybe don't appreciate the Asian roots or don't, don't understand maybe the difference between mindfulness and Buddhism. And, you know, just the fact that there's so much more to it than simply like meditating silently by yourself. (laughs) Yeah. And there's, you know, so many different ways to approach everything. And I think, you know, our goal at BSO is to, you know, we're an academic organization. We're not sectarian. We're not trying Mm -hmm. to convert anyone. We are not Mm -hmm. teaching Buddhism, teaching about Buddhism (laughs) from this academic historical point of view. But I think that can be really complementary with other forms of instruction because you get a better sense of, you know, you want to be like rooted in place, Mm -hmm. but every now and then, you know, popping up above and taking a survey of the landscape can be just usefully orienting. Mm-hmm. And I think actually we as academics have not been very good at helping people do this. Yeah. And and part of that is because, as you said, people make academic careers out of getting hyper, hyper, <laughs> hyper specialized. And I am no different. Um, I know a lot about 13th to 17th century Tibetan Buddhist mountain pilgrimage, (laughs) specifically on the theme of visualization. I love it. You know, and in some ways, my training even reflects that. The amount of Mm -hmm. outside reading I had to do on my own to to feel competent talking about types of Buddhism outside my, Mm -hmm. you know, little teeny area of specialization (laughs) uh, is a great deal. And so, you know, I think it's incumbent upon us academics to try to reach a broader audience, to try to speak with people outside our specific college classrooms. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, I think I come across this. I I did my PhD at Rice, graduated in 2015. And since then, I've been working in, first of all, my Dharma Center, Don Mountain. Woohoo! Shout out to Don Mountain. Um, (laughs) And then after that, you know, I've been sort of working on my own. And I really, having come from that, you know, academic background, I think I feel the absence of it sometimes, or, you know, I, I get a sense that people are hungry to understand more about this, this aspect of it, or even that they don't know that there's more out there that they could be learning. You know, often I've heard, like, I I had a a friend in a a PhD program who actually said like, wait, there's heresy in Buddhism. Like, how could that even be a thing? And I was like, oh, that's why I'm writing my dissertation about Buddhist heretics, because there's always heresy. <laughs> there's always there's always something to transgress. And, you know, I think it's just, um, it's nice to know that you have a sense, like you said, you kind of popped up, you've got the lay of the land, and you know kind of where you are if you're practicing Zen or mindfulness or Tibetan Buddhism or, or whatever your chosen path is. And I think I sort of, an orientation that's useful in religious studies on the academic side is that you approach religion as a human phenomenon yeah, um, made by and for humans. Whereas if you're approaching from a Dharma perspective, you're approaching it as the truth about the universe. <laughs> and 
Um, those things are actually not necessarily in competition with each other because you have humans trying to find the truth. Mm -hmm. But sometimes one of the difficulties of approaching from a Dharma side is, you know, particularly if you're coming from a background of having been, you know, scarred by whatever you grew up with or just dissatisfied by it. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes you can initially encounter Buddhism and want to latch onto it and say, oh, yes, finally, this is the truth. It's going to be free of all of the kind of whatever I didn't like about what <laughs> what I left behind was. Yeah. And, you know, that can can be really great because people find stuff that they felt like they were missing. Mm -hmm. But also it can kind of put blinders on you in a certain mm -hmm. way insofar mm -hmm. as you only see, like, sometimes what you want to see or you mm -hmm. only see kind of what you think the truth is. Right. Which, which may or may not actually be what the tradition always says. Right. Uh, you may not see the internal diversity in the tradition. You may not see mm -hmm. the historical change. And so um, taking this broader historical view of, yeah, humans, you know, even on a Dharma perspective, what we have is humans trying to pass down what we heard as maybe the truth. Yeah. You know, the Buddha never wrote anything down in his lifetime. So... Everything that we have, written by and for humans in a certain kind of way. And I don't mean that to, you know, be sacrilegious or anything like that, but <laughs> you, you, you can never escape that human dimension mm -hmm. in a certain place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's good to have that in mind. And I just want to say, you know, after we kind of talk about BSO 101 and 102, which we haven't even mentioned yet, which is also super cool, I do want to, you know, talk to you more about religious studies and your own personal journey and your dissertation research, which sounds so fascinating on pilgrimage, got to go to cool places, it sounds like. Um, but I'm just kind of curious, you know, could you maybe um, introduce us to or just give like a, you know, a, a bird's eye view overview of the curriculum of BSO 101? I know you start with sort of introducing, okay, who's the Buddha? Who's the Dharma? What's the Dharma? Who's the Sangha? Could you just, you know, let people know all the goodies that are in there? Yes, so um, Buddhist Studies Online, BSO 101, Intro to Buddhism, colon, History, Philosophy, and Practice <laughs> is meant to be kind of a bird's eye level overview of the Buddhist tradition from its origins in India to its spread throughout Asia and now in the modern world. And it is non-sectarian, oriented towards a kind of historical and philosophical approach. And I break it down into six different modules. So to start, we introduce the Buddha and his world. Essentially, what is, wh where does the Buddha come from? What was his historical, social, religious context? What did he perceive was the problem with his world? And having a sense of this problem helps you contextualize the answer that the Buddha comes up with. So, you know, where did the Buddha come from in terms of all these different things shaping his background, leading us to be able to contextualize his teachings? Um, the next one is the Buddha's teachings, and I frame this as kind of a gradual path. So the Buddha kind of diagnoses the problem with humans as, you know, sort of fundamental suffering stemming from ignorance, and he charts this path towards the total overcoming of suffering in the form of awakening or enlightenment. And so, you know, how does the Buddha suggest that you get from suffering to awakening? And we look at the Buddha's teachings as oriented in that way, specifically through reading the Dhammachaka Pavatana Sutta, the Sutta of the Turning the Wheel, the Buddha's first sermon, and think about how all of those things work together. In the process, you end up you know, having to unpack all these kind of important Buddhist terms, karma, rebirth, mm -hmm. the Four Noble Truths, Eightfold Path, and how are these things kind of structured? It was also important for me in this not to just think about, you know, in certain ways, the picture that we get of Buddhism in the modern West is very meditation focused. Yes. It's very much focused on what traditionally might have been done by, you know, five, ten percent of the population max, right? Monks maybe would meditate, but, you know, mm. most people, they had jobs, they had kids, <laughs> they had stuff to do. So how does the Buddhist, how do the Buddhist teachings kind of map on to wherever people are starting on the yes. path. Yes. 
so important. I think sometimes people put so much pressure on themselves to meditate as if that was their only job. <laughs> and just knowing like that's traditionally people had jobs. They weren't meditating all day long and you can still be a Buddhist even if that's the situation. You could never meditate and still be a Buddhist. Yeah, and I think, you know, in order to fully understand that, we need to take seriously the notion that, well, if you're in a universe where you can be reborn multiple mm -hmm. times, right, it's not on you exactly. in this lifetime to do all of this. In some ways, if you as a lay person don't have time to meditate yourself, mm -hmm. but you can support other people doing it, mm -hmm. the barrier between you and them is really broken down yeah. such that you can see the Buddhist teachings as... Um, kind of open to anyone mm -hmm. at whatever point of the path that you're on mm -hmm. and that everyone on that path is connected. Yes. In a fundamental way. Exactly. I love that sense of the connection and the, the interrelationship that, you know, the, the patron, so to speak, whoever is supporting the folks doing the retreat in the cave somewhere, that they're, they're participating in the same project. Mm. And that, you know, the goal is like the elimination of suffering, right? Mm -hmm. It's not just the elimination of my suffering. Exactly. <laughs> you know, and once you, you know, really take seriously, um, and, you know, people can differ whether they want to see rebirth as mm -hmm. um, a literal reality, as a metaphor, as both, as something more complicated, as a sort of motivational tool. We can talk lots more about that. But one of the fundamental outcomes of this doctrine is that this barrier between self and other gets broken down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which I think is so important, just because we're yeah. so kind of individually focused yeah. in the modern world. Exactly. So then the third module um, is called How to Change Your Mind, Monks, <laughs> Morality, and Meditation. So, and for those of you sort of paying attention, um, these first three modules uh, follow the three jewels. So we have Buddha, <laughs> who's the Buddha, Dharma, the Buddha's teachings, and now the Sangha, the community of Buddhist practitioners. And so we focus on the Buddhist community of monks and nuns and on the various practices that they have in order to kind of move them along this gradual path. And that, of course, it involves talking about meditation. So what is meditation? What are the various components of it? How is it framed? Um, but also uh, the Buddhist monastic law as embodied in the Vinaya. What does kind of morality as conceptualized in terms of Buddhist uh, shila, uh, discipline, what does that have to do with anything else? And again, this is something that often gets left out of modern Western presentations of Buddhism. Yeah. Because we like to imagine that Buddhism is like, no rules, man. <laughs> Anything goes. Just be compassionate. Right. <laughs> when actually, you know, the taking of vows is so important both for Buddhist lay people, but especially for monastics. And it's seen as necessary in order mm -hmm. to be able to meditate. Right. You need to learn to discipline your body as a tactic of disciplining your mind so that your mind can be kind of made fertile for mm -hmm. this kind of transformation. And so I think talking about that helps take this subject that I think a lot of people just overlook because they don't think of it as relevant to their lives. Yeah. And, you know, just see how it plays into this broader conception of the gradual path. Mm -hmm. and I think a lot of people, too, may come to Buddhism already with a bad experience of ethics or discipline or, you know, whatever their tradition might have called it. And it's really it, it's a very different topic in Buddhism. You know, it's more like here's some ideas for how to train instead of like you will go to hell if. Yeah. And when you read these kind of Vinaya stories closely, you get to sort of see, you know, it's not just, OK, here's a rule. You got to follow it. It's yeah. In the Vinaya, there's a rule, and then there's a story about why the rule had to be implemented. <laughs> and so, you know, you, and this cuts both ways. You can see how this, these sorts of rules are useful for governing a life that is oriented towards awakening. But you also see that these rules are formed in a particular historical and social yeah. context. Yeah. And in a certain way, that means that if your historical and social context is different, mm -hmm. perhaps different rules are appropriate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The morality of Twitter, for instance. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to be a kind of person who, you know, really just could give it up. <laughs> alas. Yeah. <laughs> Again, we are, we are modern humans and it may not be that easy to just, you know, live your life without a phone or something like that. But I think that does get to an important point about a, what a lot of the Vinaya rules are structured towards mm -hmm. and what kind of our modern social media environment mm -hmm. limits us. 
you know, we're inclined to think that more choices is better. Mm -hmm. Anyone who's been, spent any time on the internet knows that you feel overwhelmed, stressed yeah. out, yeah. Um, kind of mean, <laughs> and, um, that more actually reduces the space in your mind. Mm -hmm. And so you can almost see the veneer rules as not necessarily restricting freedom, mm -hmm. but as opening up a possibility of freedom, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Because the way that we tend to live our lives is just so inherently distracting, um, mm -hmm. uh, leading us down various negative paths, we might say. <laughs> yes. So, uh, so that's the first half. And so we spent a lot of time in kind of early Buddhism laying foundations. And then in the second half of the course, we look towards how Buddhism has changed and transformed as it's moved. So module four is about Mahayana Buddhism, the great vehicle. So what is the motivation behind, you know, why do folks who call themselves adherents of the Mahayana, what do they think that they're doing, right? And that may not necessarily be what um, mainstream Buddhists, uh, what we might now call the thing that evolved into Theravada Buddhism. They might not assent to that, but you get a sense of why did the folks who started the Mahayana think that it was necessary? Mm -hmm. And so we also see that Mahayana Buddhism is this incredibly vast and diverse thing such that it's, it's hard to even define what Mahayana Buddhism is. Yeah. And we read some of the kind of important texts in, in terms of the Lotus Sutra, the Heart Sutra, Pure Land Sutra, the Bodhicharya Avatara, Shantideva's How to Be a Bodhisattva, and think about how Mahayana reimagines this path that the Buddha laid out from ignorance to awakening. And, you know, I really like that insofar as we can see that internal to the Buddhist tradition, people are disagreeing yeah. about central ideas. Yeah. And so, you know, I find so many people um, in the modern world are like, you know, and sometimes there are 19 year olds taking my intro to Buddhism class and they'll be like, no, Buddhism is this. Yeah. It's, like, it's real confident of you. <laughs> right. <I> and it, <laughs> there is a long history of Europeans doing that too. You know, picking this part and then discarding all the native wisdom of the places where they found these things. And then suddenly it becomes much easier to kind of domesticate this tradition or to take the parts that, you know, don't confront our metaphysical assumptions quite as mm -hmm. much as maybe the big picture of Buddhism does. Yeah, and I think it's also a thing that Buddhists themselves have done. Yeah. <laughs> Throughout Buddhist history, you'll find, you know, if you go to, um, you know, Kamakura era Japan, you'll see mm. Nichiren being like, oh yeah, um, most of this isn't very important. <laughs> Just right. chant the Lotus Sutra. Right. Um, you know, that's, a, that's a really interesting claim. Like, <laughs> why do people do that? And, and how do you get to be a person in a tradition where, you know, um, you know, what did folks in the Mahayana think that they were doing? Because mm -hmm. I think they thought that they were reducing suffering. Mm -hmm. And so how did they sort of reimagine the tradition in order to mm -hmm. do that? Um, and so, you know, you get to kind of imagine what it would be like to be in the tradition. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. You know, these are people, too. They're trying to make sense of their world. Yeah. And, and I appreciate the way that kind of undermines... Like you're saying this, or I don't think you use this word, but like this essentialized vision of Buddhism where there's an essence to it and everything else is a cultural accretion. And it turns out, no, from basically the very beginning, people have been negotiating what goes into the tradition and what gets excluded. And it's never been a passive process or just, you know, like a matter of fact or something. Yeah, because, you know, if it were the case that, you know, all Buddhists could agree on, you know, some basic things... <laughs> You know, we wouldn't have the piles and piles of writings. Uh, <laughs> exactly. That we do in fact have from Buddhists. <laughs> One of my favorite, um, you know, so when students write papers for me, um, they always make you know typos, and I save the really amusing typos. <laughs> but one of my favorite typos that a student ever made is they said the first noble truth of Buddhism is intransigence. Oh. And I think they were going for impermanence or transience. <laughs> Neither of which is necessarily the first noble truth, but right. you know, multiple things going on. I'm sure they wrote this very early in the morning. Yeah. Um, but I, I do actually really love that, 
that the first noble truth of Buddhism is intransigence, just sort of refusal <laughs> to just like do what you're told. Yeah, yeah. Or like shift with reality as it shifts. Because mm-hmm. I say that to my students all the time who will mostly have grown up in Christian context. Mm-hmm. And I'll say, is it your experience that when somebody tells you, um, oh, you should do this, you should do that, do you look around your community and see everyone just doing that? <laughs> do you do that? And they right. say no. You know, um, I think this, or I have, you know, this interest or this belief that doesn't necessarily square with, you know, what I'm told. I said, I need you to imagine allowing people in the past, people in Asia, uh, to have the same um, depth of humanity Mm -hmm. that you allow for yourself. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Drop this idealized image of, like, these enlightened Buddhists sitting on mountaintops or something. (laughs) Yeah, Buddhists are intransigent. They don't do right. what you think they're supposed to do. <laughs> exactly. I kind of like that as a translation for the second noble truth, the cause of dukkha or an unsatisfactoriness. It gets kind of intransigent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but also, you know, the condition for the possibility of seeing things in a new way. Right? Yeah. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> um, yeah, I also, you know, less sort of philosophically productive typos include someone telling me that the Um, The Buddha came to solve the problem of surfing. (laughs) I had somebody who wrote an entire five-page paper instead of on the discourse of loving kindness. She wrote the paper on the discourage of loving kindness. Oh, no! (laughs) Did she she think we were not supposed to be loving or kind? (laughs) It is not clear. Oh, no! Sometimes college students write papers late at night with not too much... um, (laughs) you know, editing happening afterwards. <laughs> yeah. But I really like that. I, I think, yeah, I mean, discourse is not a word that we use all the time. She That's probably true. spelled it wrong and it autocorrected to something and then she just went with it. <laughs> That's a charitable interpretation. <laughs> One of my favorite of my teacher, Anne Klein's, um, reported, it, it's not a typo, but, um, one of the students uh, talked about instead of samsara, which is the cycle of birth, unsatisfactoriness, death, and then rebirth again, they called it some sorrow. Which, samsara. yeah, yes. I like the feeling tone of that. <laughs> yeah, and especially you know, um, in Sanskrit, that prefix some kind of implies like a totality or like a oh. you know, it's it's collective sorrow. Or, you know, <laughs> that works even better. <laughs> um. Students, you know, you'll learn stuff, you know, from, again, these productive errors. And, yeah. You know, I feel like this is a move I do all the time, but that's actually something that happens in the Buddhist tradition as well. Mm-hmm. Someone reads something, writes something, and, you know, from one perspective, you could call that an error. Mm-hmm. From another perspective, you can say, wow, that opened up a new way of thinking about things that I think is actually really revealing. Yeah. Of something really useful. Yeah, yeah. It might be surprising to know how many insights actually come from that. It's it's not just like people being brilliant and profound. It's also people messing stuff up and having to figure it out sometimes. That happens a lot with, um, you know, so I specialize in Tibetan Buddhism. When Sanskrit texts are translated into Tibetan, you get kind of these new formations Mm -hmm. where, you know, Arhat in Sanskrit or Arahant in Pali gets... Um, you know, which gets translated into Tibetan, Tibetan as enemy destroyer. Mm-hmm. And initially it had meant something like worthy one. And so that's a very different meaning. You can kind of yeah. see why uh, the switch was made, but what a different way of understanding it. And so you yeah. see that kind of thing product, like happen whenever Buddhism crosses linguistic boundaries. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The word enlightenment for, you know, as a translation for, for Bodhi or for, like, for awakening. Um, mm-hmm. It always happens, like you're saying, in these moments of, like, cross-cultural interpretation and transformation and, and something new gets born. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so in some ways, you know, right, we have all these modern dis- d- debates about how do you translate stuff into English, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, mindfulness, enlightenment versus awakening, you know all these kinds of terms and you know on the one hand it's you know i think valid to criticize the way that buddhism has changed specifically in our modern context which is so 
you know, commodified and so mm-hmm. tied up with, um, you know, denigration of the traditional places that mm-hmm. these traditions have come from. Mm-hmm. But also you can situate that within a broader history of mm-hmm. Buddhism moves across borders and changes and transforms mm-hmm. and gets transformed even as it transforms. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It is not permanent as it turns out. <laughs> I know. It's a, uh, you know, and it's an interesting thing. And I, I do think that, you know, my orientation as an academic to be kind of non-sectarian mm-hmm. applies in those contexts as well. Mm-hmm. I think, you know, another m- sort of trap we can fall into is to say, you know, any change in Buddhism that happens in the modern period is, you know, ipso facto illegitimate. Right, right. And then, you know, okay, w- what date do you want to cut <laughs> things off from? Because you're going to cut off a lot of you know, Japanese Buddhism, <laughs> Tibetan Buddhism, you know. Um, who gets to, to be kind of quote unquote traditional and who gets to be yeah. modern? It, by the time anything was written down, it was already several hundred years after the time of the Buddha. So was the Buddha not Buddhist? I mean, where do you, yeah, where do you stop? He's arguably the least Buddhist of all of us. Probably. <laughs> so then um, in the fifth module, we tackle actually a lot of these same questions. Um, and it's called How to Get Enlightened Fast. <laughs> I Sean, love this. Zen and Tantra. <laughs> I have a lot of fun with titles. Um, and so sort of within this context of Mahayana Buddhism, as Buddhism moves to new contexts, you actually see a transformation of the gradual path that the Buddha initially lays out. So you go from ignorance to awakening over the course of many, many lifetimes of slow and gradual transformation. But actually, some folks in the Mahayana thought that, for various reasons, um, that was actually part of the problem, keeping you trapped in ignorance, thinking that it had to be this slow and gradual process. And in fact, perhaps there are ways of realizing awakening more quickly. And so in Chan and Zen, that will happen in terms of realizing that there's no way that you could become enlightened in the way that you can't polish clay Mm -hmm. into glass. In order for something to become glass, it always had to be glass. So maybe it is the fact that we have the nature of enlightenment already inside us. We just need to realize it. Or for Tantra, um, there are ways perhaps of thinking about ritual and Mm -hmm. sort of the direct teaching lineage from one master to student, um, allowing you to have this insight into awakening that can transform you very, very quickly. And again, you know, how is it that the Buddha's teachings led to these things that are so radically different Mm -hmm. and yet have equal claim to being totally inspired by and motivated by the same problems that motivated the Buddha? Mm -hmm. In one of the Tibetan criteria for determining if something is Buddha Vachana, the word of the Buddha is, if you put it into practice, does it help? And I, I love that as a criterion for deciding, like, does this belong in Buddhism? You know, it's not just about like textual purity or, you know, these different ways that you might try to control what goes into the tradition. And if you look at all these different paths, you can see people right now benefiting from, you know, all the things you've just talked about, even if it's not something that was necessarily in the earliest, you know, historical attested textual versions of the Buddhist tradition. And it's interesting how many metaphors exist for this throughout the Buddhist tradition, even in, you know, Theravada, which we might sort of think of as the most, you know, lowercase c, conservative of Buddhist traditions, that there's certain ways of conceptualizing, well, the Buddha went up to heaven and taught in uh, the Trishramsha, heaven to his mother. And the amount of teachings that we have are only a a fraction of the sort of total dharma. Um, And, you know, various Buddhists conceptualizing the canon, the collection of Buddhist texts that we have as always incomplete Mm, mm -hmm. and also too large to be read by anyone. And so there's this sense that we don't, we we have a lot, but there's always more that can be said. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, And so then in the uh, final module, the future of Buddhism, Buddhism and modernity, we think about how Buddhism changes and transforms as it enters in modernity. Although, of course, you know, what is modernity? What do we start it? <laughs> and as it spreads to places in the modern West. Um, and 
you know, in some ways this is playing with themes that have been present in these past couple of modules, but how do you balance kind of adherence to tradition with mm -hmm. the need for new things in new times and places? What kind of is the landscape of what, how Buddhism exists you know, today? And where do we think that it's going, right? Um, so we just finished a BSO class called Buddhism and Climate Change. Mm. And this is an interesting thing. Uh, in the Pali Canon, as far as I can tell, the Buddha never mentions climate change. <laughs> um, and yet, it's clearly something that exists in the modern world that mm -hmm. has the potential to and arguably has already caused great suffering. Mm -hmm. And so is climate change something about which Buddhism has something to say? You know. And of course, when we were advertising this class, we got lots of angry comments of, you know, you're changing Buddhism to the modern world. Mm. Says, well, <laughs> you know, these are things that cause suffering in the modern world. And if you're right. trying to tell me that the Buddha didn't have anything to say about things that cause suffering, you know. Factually incorrect. But <laughs> yeah. I don't necessarily think so. Yeah. <laughs> um, but certainly people can disagree about how. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, and there's lots of sort of things in the modern world that we can think about, you know, will Buddhism change to address them? Mm -hmm. um, how? Who gets to say? Who gets to be in charge of all of this stuff? And just, you know, I don't have answers here. I wish I did. Uh, but just exploring these kinds of questions. Mm -hmm. I, I think, you know, we're basically living through this period. I, probably for both of us, I mean, we're used to analyzing a historical period, maybe watching the textual progression of certain ideas about certain things, and usually it plays out over centuries. And it is an interesting time to be in the middle of it and to see how it's playing out right now with technology where people can share their thoughts, basically publish their own text like in real time and respond to each other. And, you know, I think all of those questions, and especially like who gets to decide how Buddhism changes... You know, this is not, it's not a spectator sport. Like, it's something that we're all engaged in. And I think knowing that we're engaged in it is really helpful, um, you know, for those of us who are interested in practicing Buddhism. Yeah, and for folks, you know, uh, whether you're a Buddhist or not, but, yeah. you know, are interested in just reducing suffering. Right, you know? right, exactly. Figuring out how to live in a modern era with as much loving kindness and as little destructiveness as possible. Lots of loving kindness, little discourage. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, that sounds like a great article headline. <laughs> no, I always work backwards from title to <laughs> everything else. And so, um, but basically, you know, that's the course. And it really models what I do teach in the college classroom. And, you know, which I think is really good. Because, you know, particularly, you know, I teach at the University of Wyoming. We're a very small state. We're very rural. We're very um, not particularly ethnically or religiously diverse. <laughs> and so a lot of my students are coming in with really not very much exposure to Buddhism. Mm -hmm. It's actually mm -hmm. an interesting counterpoint to teaching as I do in, you know, more Dharma contexts, right? Mm -hmm. You have a different sort of audience than, you know, my 18-year-olds <laughs> who are taking this class because they have to take at least one global awareness class. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah definitely um i, I just i just want to you know reflect for a moment like where i did my my graduate work and where i did my teaching at a university level i mean to get to sit in on a course it would be thousands of dollars and you have to like drive to campus and you know show up in person and i just love that at, BSO 101 is like $175. Is that right? Yes. Are you we kidding? <laughs> For a semester's worth of information? <laughs> and we do also, so, you know, one of my goals for starting BSO is, you know, I do think that instructors should be fairly compensated for their mm -hmm. sort of time and effort, um, you know, because a lot of work goes into, you know, writing these things and putting them on. Yes. Um, a lot also, of work. Also, we don't turn anyone away because of yeah. their inability to pay. And so, you know, if anyone's listening to this and say, that's great, but, you know, $175 is kind of steep where I'm at currently, yeah. email info at BuddhaStudiesOnline.com. We can work something out. We also offer standard discounts to 
graduate students and monastics who are alike and having taken vows of poverty <laughs> right. is sort of my running joke. Yeah, sort of celibacy too if you came in single to grad school. <laughs> or maybe that was we, just me. We don't inquire. <laughs> right. <laughs> don't ask, don't tell. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah uh, it, and I just want to say you can find, you know, links to check it out, find more information, and also that email address, info at BSO, I'm sorry, Buddhist Studies Online. Yes. Dot com. Info at BuddhaStudiesOnline.com. Yeah, that way, you know, it's just such a great resource and hopefully everybody will be able to access it who's interested in it. Mm-hmm. Especially those, you know, if you're not coming from like North America or Europe, like, yeah, it is a very different price point in that case. So I mm-hmm. hope I hope people won't be discouraged by that. Yes. Do um, not discourage. <laughs> yes. Minimal discourage. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so just, you know, trying to make that more broadly available um, with the goal of, again, like, historians don't have answers to future problems. Historians mm-hmm. are really bad at predicting things. They don't <laughs> know the answers to stuff in the future. But I do think that you do get from the study of the past, seeing how things have mm-hmm. changed and how communities have reinterpreted and mm-hmm. reformed, that sense that Yes, we are currently participating in yeah. making the future. Yeah. Um, so I do think of, you know, teaching as something that involves the, there's like me, the teacher, there's my student, whoever that student happens to be at that time. There's the material mm-hmm. that is often coming from the past that is I want to be an equal participant. Mm-hmm. But then also I hope like the future has a seat at the table. Sometimes when I say that, people's like eyes glaze over, but... <laughs> You know, how do we think towards a future? Yeah, well, I mean, the idea of dependent origination has, it's it's so woven into the DNA of Buddhism and dependent origination, meaning because of this, that arises. Um, you know, what we're doing now, like you're saying, I mean, I think implicitly the future always, we are shaping it. <laughs> So can we take it into consideration? It, it doesn't seem like too much to ask. <laughs> and that's like, you know, the, the fundamental <laughs> mistake um, that so many people make when they study Buddhism, dependent origination, is they'll say, oh, like, you know, there is no inherent existence, therefore nothing I do matters. And it's, right. It's so the opposite, right? No, like, <laughs> right. actually, insofar as you're entangled in dependent origination, every action that you take has, you know, long ripples of effect. So, like... Choose a good action. <laughs> exactly. Hence the importance of Sheila, morality, or just knowing what you are doing. <laughs> yes. Uh, so difficult. So difficult to know. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my goodness. Well, I just, I appreciate so much this, like, overview. Um, I'm working through the materials myself. I'm not all the way through, but they're just such a, a wonderful introduction slash review slash different perspective on certain things. Um, And I know we don't actually have the time for you to give us such an in-depth description of BSO 102, but I want to mention it and maybe ask for an overview because it is about Buddhist meditation. And I think for anyone who has ever sat down and tried to figure out for yourself how to just teach yourself Buddhist meditation... (laughs) It is not easy. There's a ton of stuff out there. And, you know, that was kind of me when I started to a certain extent, like just trying to figure out what to do. And I think just knowing the landscape would have been so helpful for me and I think could be for others. So what is in BSO 102 um, and, and what is the benefit of it for maybe people who are interested in practicing or meditating, whether they're Buddhist or not? Yes. So BSO 102 um, Buddhist meditation in theory and practice was the second course that we offered at Buddhist Studies Online. And in some ways, um, I love talking about all the BSO classes that aren't the one that I taught. Because <laughs> I get to just hype up the wonderful instructors that we invited <laughs> to teach these classes rather than, you know. Um, Trying to blow your own horn. I'll just you know, blow it. Your ways, course is awesome. <laughs> it is audacious to the point of... Um, embarrassing to try to think that you can teach an overview to Buddhism. And so I'm very much synthesizing the materials that many, many others have done. Um, But, you know, you get to really celebrate the achievements of scholars. 
um, you know, as you will be when you come to teach our a BSO course. Yes, I'm very excited about that. Yes, and then I rebirth, reincarnation. Not exactly sure what it'll be called, but uh, hopefully yeah. January. <laughs> death and rebirth, death and reincarnation. Rebirth, yeah, rebirth and death. You know. Yeah. We'll, Ooh. We'll figure out yeah. the, the order. <laughs> um, but yes, then I get to sort of sit back, invite people that I like and think are smart, and just get to learn myself. And then I fall into, you know, more my admin role. There's a lot of people who email BSO um, and they say, you know, to, to whoever it is that's answering these emails, and like, oh, it's just me. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's just me and um, a graduate student in Europa, actually, who um, handles some of the inbox. Oh, right on. Catherine, she's fantastic. Um, but because I'm Kate and she's Catherine, <laughs> most people, um, you know, just see us as one unit. Um, so... For BSO 102, the idea is it's, again, focus on the kind of history and philosophy and practices of Buddhism, but in this case, delving deeper into the meditation side, right? Because in some ways, BSO 101, because it's covering so much stuff, the amount of times that it touches on meditation is relatively low. In fact, because often the kind of misconception I'm trying to address is that people think that Buddhism's all about meditation. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. Look at all these other things. <laughs> You're balancing it out with everything else. <laughs> yes. And so this course gets to be kind of a deep dive into the history of Buddhist meditation. And so, you know, what is mindfulness historically? What meditation techniques did the Buddha practice? You know, we have this broad umbrella term meditation. What are the different forms? How do they change over time? Um, what was Buddhist theory for how these techniques would change people. And also, like, it's an interesting question to ask. What does it mean to study meditation historically from an academic point of view, right? Because again, in studying Buddhism, there's so many ways to be an expert at it. And there's so many ways to engage. And so this is kind of looking at meditation theory in Buddhism. And so it starts with the Pali Canon and the, the specific texts that talk about meditation the Satipatthana Sutta, the Foundations of Mindfulness Sutta, you know, our big focus. But then looking at kind of how it transforms in different contexts. So um, Yogacara um, in India, this particular school of meditation that Daniel Stewart's actually an expert in, how meditation looks when it gets transmitted to China, a deeper dive into tantric forms of meditation into Tibet, and then the last module looks at transformations into modernity. So like, why is it that Vipassana retreats are a thing? How is it that mindfulness came to be kind of talked about in the modern world? You know, all of these things have their own history. And mm -hmm. in some ways, piecing together that history, you get to see, you know, specific points, um, you know, in the case of Vipassana retreats, like, you know, Burmese, meditation teachers who had students who went to the West. And so you get to see, again, what was done, how it was understood, how it transformed, but focus specifically on meditation. That's so fascinating. I think, you know, I tend to have, at least I should say, approaching this as a practitioner and even someone studying, you know, the philosophy and history of Tibetan Buddhism, I just kind of assumed, oh, these practices just come down to us from the time of the Buddha. And I'm reading a book about esoteric Theravada right now. I forget the author. Yes, it's so good. So good. I studied Thai forest um, meditation when I first started getting into, you know, meditation and, and the Dharma back in uh, 1997. And, you know, I just thought like, wow, this is this ancient, you know, this is what the Buddha practiced. And now I'm learning there is a more tantric version of... Theravada meditation practices that actually these Vipassana retreats are quite recent, you know, from the 1800s. And they're pa partially an interaction, you know, with Western colonizing powers. And they are themselves a Buddhist response to modernity. So I think, you know, for me, this kind of course is super helpful, you know, for really understanding what I'm doing <laughs> where it comes from, where I sit in the lineage of, of Buddhism, because we all do, even if you're not Buddhist, you're just doing these practices, you're now relating to something that kind of echoes back through all this history. And um, I just, 
I really appreciate it being made so accessible. Yeah, because, you know, things sort of exist. I'll start with that <laughs> premise. Although, you know, from a Buddhist context, I don't know that, that I can yeah. be so bold. Yeah, sort of is good to modify exist. <laughs> but they, there are sort of understandable interests that people have to claim that certain things are very, very old or go mm -hmm. back to Buddhism. And when you have something that claims to be super old and people who are looking for something that is super old, right. you kind of get this feedback loop that um, willfully kind of ignores a lot of history. And mm -hmm. again, you can be willfully ignorant a lot of the history and go about your day perfectly fine. <laughs> um, but when you kind of, when you get to situate that, one, I think it's a really fascinating story. Mm -hmm. right? um, one that undermines the notion that there is any one, again, essential Buddhism. Mm -hmm. And two, that it undermines the notion that, oh, there's, well, traditional Buddhism over there that's mm -hmm. timeless and unchanging. And then there's like the modern West, which, mm -hmm. you know, we're just ruining everything. It just ruins everything. <laughs> and you actually see a lot more interaction than mm -hmm. you might otherwise think. Mm -hmm. And you can situate more recent changes within a history of changes and transformations, mm -hmm. which, again, mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily mean that all of the changes happening in modernity are good or right or they should be. But you, you can see kind of a, with a longer view towards history, a longer eye, of how to situate yourself in a mm -hmm. past. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, you know, to come back to one of your questions when you were talking about, you know, Buddhism and modernity in your course, BSO 101, you know, to me, part of it is also like, well, who, we're ruining it or we're improving it according to whom? You know, who benefits? Uh, who has the power to decide what Buddhism should look like? And, you know, it's not that we need answers, but I think those questions can be really helpful for people, you know, understanding what they're doing with their spiritual practice and, and not, you know, proceeding and investing a lot of energy on a certain set of assumptions and then discovering years later that, you know, maybe there's more to it than that. Maybe I'm not doing the one pristine Dharma form that has always existed. Yeah, I think, you know, you know, I'm always trying to think, and again, teaching in a college context with students who you may or may not want to be there in my classroom. <laughs> um, you know, I always think about, you know, the 20-year test. In 20 years, mm. most people are going to forget 90% of what I teach them. But, like, maybe they'll remember one or two things. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, what's the one or two things I want them to remember? Yeah. And actually, you know, I think this comes across in some of the work I've done with BSO is a sense of humility. Mm -hmm. right? That... Um, you know, claims to knowledge, claims to know mm -hmm. what to do, claims to know what is right. Um, and again, take this with a grain of salt because I had the audacity to teach BSO 101 <laughs> in <intro to> Buddhism. <laughs> um, and the great but, kindness. <laughs> <laughs> nice. um, but, the, but I do think the more I study, the more I realize I don't know. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, you know, that, that may sound kind of defeating, but actually, mm -hmm. it's really empowering, I think, to mm -hmm. recognize that you are kind of embedded in this broader historical mm -hmm. process. Um, you don't have access to everything that people did in the past. You don't know what's going to happen in the future. Mm -hmm. um, but you can you know, do your best to, to learn and to study and to, to try to be a good person and to try to reduce suffering. Mm -hmm. um, and that you've, you feel that kind of smallness in the face of history. Yeah. I think is is so good and, and helps you interact with others and particularly with others that you disagree with in ways that can, I think, be um, informed by that humility. Yeah, I love it. I feel like maybe this is a perfect place to wrap up our conversation for today because, wow, I mean, that humility, again, if people take nothing else away from this whole conversation and they just remember that, I feel like that's, so helpful and important, um, you know, especially in modern times. We have the capacity to be, to amplify kindness or to amplify unkindness and, you know, to maybe take a moment and be humble before we go putting out a lot of energy into the world could be helpful. 
yeah, to, to always seek to know more, to recognize that you're coming from a position of ignorance, and, yeah. you know, that you're somewhere on the gradual path, but again, you know, once we recognize that each other as partners in that, um, you're less likely to interact in the ways that you might on Twitter. Just mean to people. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. We're we're coming from a place of ignorance, but maybe we're unfolding into a place of greater, you know, awakeness and freedom. I love how you put that. That's that sounds wonderful. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you so much for your time and um yeah, for these courses and for your role in facilitating this. I just feel like, you know, every course that comes out, like Buddhism and animals, it, it's so fascinating and I'm really looking forward to hopefully putting together, inshallah, <laughs> to mix yes. religious traditions, uh, inshallah, putting together a course on uh, rebirth, my passion project. Um, I'm looking yeah. forward to learning a lot from said course. So, uh, Me too, in the process hopefully. of teaching it. <laughs> if you enjoyed this episode, please like and subscribe if you're watching on YouTube, or if you're listening to a podcast, please subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. And if you're listening on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, you can also leave a review. That's super helpful. Thank you. May you and all beings be well.